In 1980, a sadistic killer wrought havoc across the hiking trails of central California. He was the hunter, and he hunted people. He stalked his prey with ruthless determination. Behind the knife is a mean, vicious, sexual psychopathic killer. And executed his victims with merciless detachment. Murders the woman that he worked with. You know what he did that night? He went to the ballet. But who was behind these brutal murders? And was he born to kill? If you put him on the street today, within a week, there'd be a sexually assaulted dead woman out here. In 1981, California's Henry Cowell State Park was a mecca for the hikers of Central California. It's a very popular area. People here like to be able to use the park facilities, and they want to be able to hike and walk. There's horseback riders, bikers, uh, campers, and hikers that walk around here. On one day in March, Santa Cruz police detective Stony Brook was taking in the peace and beauty of the park. It was my day off. My son and I were uh, hiking in Henry Cal Park. We were actually headed this way from the river, and that's when I heard the shots. The first thing I thought about, I wanted to uh, get my son out of here and then do what I had to do. After speaking with park rangers, Stoney arrived at the scene of the shootings. Lying just off the trail was 21-year-old college student Ellen Hansen. Right in here. The underbrush was extremely thick, so you couldn't even see down to the tree lines there like you can now. Ellen was still in place. She was lying on her side, and uh, it was pretty obvious she was deceased at that point. Ellen and her boyfriend, Stephen Hurtle, had spent the day hiking the park's trails. They were on their spring break from UC Davis, is, uh, where they were attending school, and they were dating, and they were camping in the park and they went for a hike. They had gone up past the observation tower that gives you a panoramic view of the valley. It was here that they were attacked. Ellen had been killed by a gunshot to the head and Stephen had been shot in the neck. Critically injured, he had been rushed to hospital. Despite his injuries, he was eventually able to describe the attack. If you can imagine, this fellow steps out of nowhere, has a handgun, and saying, uh, all I want to do is, is uh, rape your girlfriend, and I want you to step off the trail, and nobody will get hurt. Ellen steps slightly between her and Steve and says, he's going to kill us anyway, and uh, basically confronted him. That's when he fires the first shot, knocks her down. He fired, uh, like, another shot into, into her head, which was the fatal wound. I've always had great admiration for Ellen, for the, the incredible courage. Probably one of the bravest young women I think I've ever become aware of. People on the observation tower all described the presence of a suspicious man. They saw him over here by the rail, looking around, and then he left, and then a few minutes later after the shots, they saw him coming back up, going past the stairway. They described him 50-ish, uh, clean-shaven, glasses, ball cap, this yellow jacket, what probably were sort of faded blue jeans and white shoes with stripes. One witness 
from a nearby neighborhood had more to offer. This little girl, 10 years old, something drew her attention to the man and how he was looking sort of frantically, which fit what we might expect somebody trying to flee. And she took a piece of cardboard and drew the shape of the little red car that he drove, which was boxy. But the most valuable witness statement was yet to come. From his hospital bed, Steve was intent on describing the man who had murdered his girlfriend. Steve survived his wound, and even though he was wounded in the throat and had a lot of difficulty uh, verbally communicating, he was very, very good in working with our artist. He holds the pad up in front of Steve, and Steve takes the back of his hand and goes, slaps on the back of it and says, you know, that's the guy. Little did they know that the man in the picture would unearth the two-year-long mystery surrounding a trail of bodies found along the San Francisco Bay. In March 1981, Ellen Hansen had been brutally murdered and her boyfriend left for dead among the trails of Henry Cowell State Park. Their attack was the latest in a series that had begun almost two years earlier in Marin County. Marin County sits just north of San Francisco. It's a relatively small county population-wise. It's connected to San Francisco by the Golden Gate Bridge. Marin County has a great deal of rural areas that are relatively undeveloped. So it's this odd mix of suburban and wilderness areas. Dominating the skyline of Marin County is Mount Tamalpais State Park. It rises up about a half of a mile. And most of the populated areas in the county, it stands majestically there. It's probably the most prominent landmark in the county. A lot of people use it. They're biking, walking all the time. It's a very popular area. In August 1979, 44-year-old bank executive Edda Kane was drawn to the remote mountainous scenery. Edda Kane was an avid hiker. She was planning to go hiking that day. She contacted a friend, tried to hook up with a friend, but didn't. And she went up on the mountain to go hiking. But that evening, Edda didn't make it home. When she didn't return, her husband called the police. So, and they went up to the area, they found her car there, and they started searching. We had an idea probably of you know, the general place that she liked to hike. And so you focus your investigation and your search into those areas. Eventually, they came upon her body. She was face down, and uh, she'd been shot in the head. She was unclothed, and she only had it maybe a sock left on her. The clothes that she'd been wearing, shoes, whatnot, they, they weren't there. Edda's murder was the first recorded in the park's history. Her naked remains hinted at the killer's motive. Obviously, there's some thought about some sort of a, a sexual assault possibly being involved. Evidence that they were able to recover at the crime scene, as I recall, there was a bullet, and it was from a 44 handgun. Uh, that's pretty much what they had to go on at the time. And the only way I can describe the crime scene is there was just some bizarre element. Whether or not that's ritualistic or not, I, I can't say, but it definitely left you with a very bizarre, strange feeling. Individuals will pose the body in a variety of different ways, which is an outgrowth of their fantasies. And it's going to be very different for each individual because individuals' sexual fantasies are very, very different and very, very unique. Now, there are commonalities. They'll usually pose the person in some type of degrading position. 
anyone who's posing victims in a specific way is trying to extend the crime scene to the, the reaction of the first people who arrive on the scene. They want something to radiate out from their crimes in a way that will uh, make them feel powerful again, just thinking about it. Seven months later, police were called back to the trails of Mount Tamalpais. Barbara Schwartz was a young woman, and she was in her early 20s. And I believe she had had some concerns, like many others after Etta Kane, about hiking on the mountain alone, so she hiked with her dog. Uh, there was a young woman who was actually out hiking on the trail also that day. She saw uh, some sort of a struggle. She called out to the person to stop what he was doing. And actually what she did is she actually turned and started to flee to go for help. Police were later faced with a horrifying scene. She had been stabbed to death, but they found her body on the trail. Her dog was with her. Uh, the dog was barking as people would, would come forward. The killer had left vital evidence at the scene. We had a discovery of a pair of eyeglasses, uh, bifocals that our investigators determined were uh, prison issue glasses. So, uh, but we ran down every possible lead. We ran down every piece of information in relation to uh, parolees who had a sex history, uh, you know, registered uh, sex offenders, uh, ran down every possible avenue. However, Unbeknownst to investigators, the following day, a quiet, unassuming 49-year-old ex-convict walked into a San Francisco optometrist looking for a replacement pair of bifocals. His name was David Joseph Carpenter. He was very bald, wore glasses, physically not large, uh, not very physically imposing, um, stuttered terribly, could not get through a sentence without stuttering terribly. He came across as a really bumbling, sort of odd character. Born in 1930, Carpenter had had a difficult childhood. Well, his father was kind of a, a weak sister uh, type of personality that wasn't a major figure in his life at all. His mother was a very outspoken, dominant, aggressive type personality who would basically ran the household. His mother especially was very controlling. She was very intelligent, but there was a real friction between them. I think he had some problems, and his mother's manner of dealing with them probably wasn't as constructive as it should have been. As he grew, Carpenter's troubles began to show. Carpenter abused animals, and he was a bedwetter. He was enuretic. It's a sign of a, of a child who is really, really struggling under a lot of stress, under a lot of pressure, and it could develop in a number of different directions. And he developed a severe stutter at a young age, which was humiliating for him and frustrating for him. And stuttering can be caused by stress, feelings of inadequacy, and inability to, to really have any sense of oneself, not really knowing where to turn, feeling unsafe. Carpenter was forced to do things that he didn't really want to do. At one point, he was re required to take ballet lessons. What you might have here is a mother who was trying to feminize her son by having him do um, dance and music uh, rather than sports, for example. So he would develop um, resentment and anger against women. Decades later, investigators were faced with a series of sexually motivated murders on the trails of Marin County. Despite their best efforts, in 1980, the killer would strike again. A man was out jogging. And uh, there's a uh, open theater on Mount Tamalpais. Beautiful sight. And he jogged through the uh, theater and he saw a young lady sitting there. The woman sitting on the steps of the amphitheater was 26-year-old Ann Alderson. She liked to meditate, and she was probably up there meditating. 
He walked through, and initially he thought about stopping, as I recall it, to let her know, you know, about things that had been happening up on, on the trail. But she appeared to be so deep in thought he didn't. But that evening, Anne didn't return home. I was there when I discovered her body. She was raped and murdered viciously. And she was left very similar to Etta Kane. Uh, that you know, kind of a ritualistic thing. Uh, she had been put through some psychological trauma before she was executed. With the discovery of a third victim, investigators were convinced they had a serial killer on their hands. The once tranquil trail had become the scene of a nightmare. With the third murder, uh, the mountain became almost devoid of people. When people lose that sense of safety and security, it's, it's frightening. Folks, by and large, like to think that they're safe in their homes and their schools. But because it was in parks, uh, created a whole different level of fear. And then, so the pushback on that is everybody's wanting it to be safe. Make it go away. We had our Marine Patrol, our Air Patrol people, community leaders, the hiking clubs working to the nth degree. I patrolled the mountain on horseback, uh, working with my posse. So many people checking license numbers, checking cars uh, on the mountain. There was not a, any car that could be on the mountain that would not have been identified. How do you imagine a person doing things like this? It was almost beyond the scope of our imagination. 33 years earlier, at the age of 17, David Carpenter's disturbing behavior had reached a new plateau. He engaged in aggressive sexual assaults from a very young age. In fact, he had attacked two of his cousins um, sexually. He was sent to a, a youth facility for uh, sex offenses as a child. So he had a long history of aberrant behavior. Carpenter had a very strong sex drive. That was part of his, his driving rage, was this need to have sex, and yet he had this stutter, so it was very hard for him to meet girls and do the socially appropriate thing. As a result, he'd feel frustrated and angry, as well as humiliated. His stint in the juvenile facility seemed to have curbed Carpenter's more violent impulses. But then, in 1960, at the age of 30, he revealed the depths of his depravity. He was driving home and saw a young woman who worked for his father, offered to give her a ride, drove her out to the Presidio of San Francisco, which was a military base, dragged her out of the car, uh, attempted to rape her, and was beating her with a hammer when a military policeman came by and fired off a round and hit him. The shot was not fatal, but Carpenter was destined for the federal penitentiary. Once he had served his time, he did not remain free for long. David was released from federal prison to San Francisco, then kidnapped a woman, took her up into the foothills, released her, uh, was sent back to prison. I met him because he was in court when I was in court, and they appointed me to represent him. And I went over and talked to him in the jail at some point. He was somebody you could talk to, as opposed to a lot of idiots that you represented who you couldn't talk to. He was not upset, nervous, angry, any of those things that some people are. Carpenter's offenses were not listed as sexual. And in 1979, having spent 17 years of his life behind bars, 49-year-old David Carpenter's sentence was complete. I went down to do a pre-release seminar, and this five foot seven, five foot eight, bald, bespeckled individual walked up to me, stuttering quite badly, and asked me if I was one of the probation officers from San Francisco, and I said yes. He was going to be paroled back to San Francisco, he was released to a halfway house, and I started supervising him on parole. 
Twelve months later, police were no closer to catching the killer who was terrorizing Marin County. And a single day in November 1980 would spread panic through the entire region. By 1980, investigators were convinced that a brutal serial killer was stalking the trails of Mount Tamil Pius. Unaware of the fear gripping the community, a young Coast Guard was preparing for a move to the area. Rick just thought it was what he wanted to do. He knew he needed to get some training and education that he could get through the Coast Guard. He actually liked boot camp. I was sort of surprised him because he didn't like it when I used to tell him things to do. Richard Stowers had met and fallen in love with 18-year-old Cynthia Morland. She had long, dark hair. She liked the outdoors. Rick liked the outdoors. They liked hiking. Following his graduation, Richard and Cynthia decided to pay a visit to Point Reyes another of Marin's prized national parks, and home to the county's Coast Guard. I didn't know there was anything wrong until on the 15th when uh, Cynthia's sister called me and said, Rick and Cindy are missing. And it was basically handled as a missing persons report. And a matter of fact, the uh, Coast Guard even, uh, I think, set a warrant out for him for being AWOL. Richard and Cynthia's disappearance was treated as a missing persons case. But investigators would find themselves at the same park six weeks later, following the disappearance of yet another young woman. It was a day after Thanksgiving. Diane O'Connell went hiking. She was with her two friends uh, hiking down this trail known as Sky Trail. Uh, she was second in line. When they get to the bottom of the trail, the first lady, she's waiting for the other two to come. What happened is the third friend, who had been the third person in line, came, and Diane wasn't with them. And they waited and waited, and Diane didn't appear, so they went and reported to the rangers. So they started searching the area, attempting to find Diane O'Connell. Rangers, volunteers, and police combed the vast parkland. Finally, they made a dreadful discovery. I came upon a, a little shoe sticking up uh, out of uh, some ferns and uh, walked a little closer and found two bodies. The two bodies belonged to missing couple Richard Stowers and Cynthia Moreland. They had been shot once in the back of the head and left face down in the underbrush. Tragically, it would not be the only discovery made that day. My captain called and said, uh, Sheriff, uh, you need to get up here to the Point Reyes. He said, uh, we have discovered four bodies. Volunteers not only discovered the body of Diane O'Connell. Lying just a few feet away were the naked remains of 23-year-old legal secretary, Shauna May. They were raped uh, and, uh, and shot, uh, and the bodies were put in proximity to one another. He put people into poses which made it look like they were being dominated. The poses were a clue that this was somebody that was doing this over and over again. And it almost leaves you speechless uh, because of the the, the nature of these areas, uh, you know, the tranquility, uh, if you will, has been broken. The shock of four bodies on one day, uh, I mean, it was uh, uh, a tragedy beyond tragedy. But finally, investigators had solid evidence which linked the murders. The one thing they did know after they found these four bodies on November 28th was they had bullets. They knew these bullets matched to Ann Alderson. So the belief is, is that the, 
same person is involved at least in those five killings. The same bullets also turned up six weeks later, following the attack on Ellen Hansen and Stephen Hurtle in Santa Cruz's Henry Cowell Park. Stephen's description of his attacker gave police a face, but they still lacked a name. Meanwhile, 50-year-old David Carpenter appeared to be committed to getting his life back on track. The two things that you needed to do with parolees were, one, where are they going to live, and two, where are they going to work? And David's parole plan was living with his two elderly parents in San Francisco, and he was at a loss as to where he could work because of his uh, history of sex offenses. Carpenter seemed to be a model parolee. He was extremely easy. He was required to send in a written report monthly, which was where are you living, have you moved, where are you working, how much money have you made, have you been arrested, all of those things. This guy was perfect. Carpenter claimed to be ready to reintegrate into society, but was worried about his future. I had conversations with David um, over the year and a half or two years that I supervised him. He would sit down and, and really talk about how he was old, didn't have a retirement plan, uh, didn't know what would become of him. Um, I think that was real. I think part of him was panicked that he was a 40-something year old guy who had been to prison a few times and uh, didn't have any skills. Carpenter was finally placed in a job just south of San Francisco. This met all our requirements where he could work in a room and wasn't around women. However, the guys that owned this facility had another segment next door where there were women. And from this location, in May 1981, just six weeks after the murder of Ellen Hansen, another young woman disappeared. I got called in the lieutenant's office, and he says, shut the door, which is never really good news. And he, he says to me, he says, can I have a case that I want you to handle? We had an adult missing persons case that had come into the department several days before. The missing person was a 20-year-old trade school apprentice named Heather Skaggs. Heather was an only child. Um, she grew up in a single family household with her mom. She had recently graduated from high school and she was working at a print shop in Hayward, California. She was doing very well there according to her employers. The first evening we went and talked to Dan Pingle, who was her, her boyfriend. Heather told him that she was gonna go with a, a fellow employee to go look at a car to buy over in Santa Cruz. Her co-worker had convinced her that the price was a really good price and he would even help her buy it if necessary and loan her the balance of the money and made it very attractive for her to go s and see this car. But he insisted she come alone and that she not tell anybody that she was going. And that bothered Pingle. And so he insisted that Heather leave the name and address and phone number with him in case she didn't come back, and she said, if I'm not back by 7 p.m., call the police. Something's happened to me. The fears of Heather's boyfriend were justified when she failed to return home. San Jose detectives immediately focused their attention on the work colleague who had accompanied her on the trip, David Joseph Carpenter. We were talking to the employers and asking what cars did he have access to and what, what did he drive to and from work, and they said, well, David Carpenter drives two cars, this blue station wagon, the, the personal plates on it, and then this little red foreign car that's parked out in the parking lot right now. Oh, interesting, little red car. After we talked to the employers, we called uh, Richard Wood at the Federal Parole Office in San Francisco. I talked to him directly and I wanted to know about David 
you know, who he was and, and how, he, how he patterned his day and how he thought. Womack was saying that Heather Skaggs was missing and the last person that saw her was David Carpenter. And he said, well, I'll contact David and I'll, and I'll find out and I'll call you back. I was very apprehensive. It's never good for a guy with his kind of record to be the last person to see a young woman who disappears. Days later, investigators found themselves face to face with David Carpenter. When we asked him how he knew Heather, the first thing he did is contort his face and twist to the side and he started stuttering so bad that I initially thought he was having a seizure. It was, it was very difficult to have a conversation with him in the beginning because he had this tremendously heavy stutter. Bumbling, stuttering, uh, tried to charm everybody, but you know, Homicide detectives aren't easily charmed. As the interview went on, David's answers began to raise suspicions. We had asked him questions we knew the answers to, and he had lied to us about some of them that were important. When I asked him specifically about the vehicles he owned, had access to, and had driven, uh, and he excluded the red Fiat, there's a red flag that comes up that says, there's something to be pursued here. As they discussed Carpenter's childhood, there was an alarming change in his demeanor. He said that I was forced to take ballet lessons, and I really resented that. And I, I interrupted him for a second when he made that comment. I said, you know, David, um, when I was nine years old, I took ballet lessons too. And he cocked his head a little bit, and he stood up, he rose above us, and he went through some basic ballet positions and started doing somewhat of a dance. And telling us the number of the positions, one, two, three. He didn't do them well, but he remembered them. And as he stood up above us talking, he didn't stutter one time. Everything that he said was in a natural uh, cadence of speech. There was, the stutter was gone. The contortion of the face was all gone. He was actually in a happy, uh, comfortable space. This is one of the things that just completely and totally amazed us. It was dramatic. It was absolutely dramatic. While Carpenter's ability to control his profound stutter was striking, the meeting was about to take a sinister turn. We got up to leave and he said, I pray to God no one finds her body and finds that she's been raped. He was looking directly at me and communicating something to me that I understood. Now I'm really thinking it's a good possibility that ultimately this is not gonna be a missing persons case, this is gonna be a homicide and that he killed Heather Skaggs. It was clear to us that we had just had an encounter with a very dangerous, cunning individual. Carpenter was immediately placed under surveillance. Detectives from Marin County and Santa Cruz joined Robinson and Womack in a bid to investigate if he was in fact connected to any of the trailside murders. After a week of interviews and surveillance, they had enough to arrest Carpenter. Stony Brook and Marin County officer Rich Keaton headed for San Francisco and to Carpenter's home where he lived with his parents. San Francisco was like uh, the other 364 days a year, it was overcast and gray. And with Carpenter's history of firearms, they took no chances. I had this backup revolver that I had had for years, and so I put that in my trouser pocket on the left-hand side. Part of the game plan for me was, as we walked up to David, I was gonna shake his hand. And it still gave me a way to be able to respond, even though I probably would ruin a perfectly good suit. We walked up to him and I said, hi, David, my name's Stony Brook. We're placing you under arrest. He was very submissive. There was 
no posturing, no threats, very subdued through the entire thing. And we loaded him in a car and drove him to the Hall of Justice, put him in an interview room. David invoked his rights and said he wanted an attorney and we never had any further conversation. Nine days later, investigators were called to a national park just west of San Jose. There were two hikers in the park itself, and they had uh, come across this trail. And apparently there was probably some uh, decomposition odors that were emanating from that area. They went over to investigate, realized it was a body, and uh, rapidly left the area to, to uh, notify authorities. The body belonged to Carpenter's co-worker, Heather Skaggs. Detective Womack and my uh, understanding is that the body was discovered at this location right here, laying with her head facing the tree and parallel to this fallen moldy tree trunk. It was clear that someone had dug enough to put her in, in the very shallow hole, cover her with dirt, debris, and brush, and then leave her. With the discovery of Heather's body came the link investigators had been looking for. The ballistics off the bullet proved positive for the gun that he used in the other murders, and his, he was matched to the seminal fluid from her body. That pretty well locks it all down. All those pieces of evidence together and pointed to no one else in the world but David Carpenter. The murder of Heather confirmed that Carpenter's reign of terror had now claimed at least nine lives. But there was another startling revelation that would reveal what beat at the heart of these brutal crimes. In 1981, David Carpenter was in custody for the brutal murders of nine people in the parks of Central California. He was positively identified by the only surviving victim, Stephen Hurtle, whose accompanying statement also contained a hint at Carpenter's yearning for control. Stephen had indicated that David spoke in a low, slow, deliberate voice. There was no speech impediments no uh, lisps, no uh, identifiable unusual speech patterns to him. The stuttering was not part of the equation. When he was out of control and, re and something so or somebody else was manipulating his life, he had communications problems, he stuttered, he was indecisive and insecure. It is this strange dichotomy that lays at the heart of just who David Carpenter is. The David that went out hunting drove a red car, wore different clothes, and didn't stutter. And this David was the hunter, and he hunted people. And the David that everyone saw, his parents, his kids, his brothers and sisters, me, was this bumbling guy. If his stutter is a result of him feeling unsafe and feeling victimized and uh, never knowing where the next blow was gonna come from, He's the one in charge now. So finally, psychologically, he's got nothing to worry about. He's powerful. So it makes sense that he would lose his stutter. Despite his frustrating stutter and deep lack of confidence, Carpenter still seemed capable of adapting to any environment. He had this unique ability uh, to come across in an audience based on what he thought they expected of him. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, if they thought he was going to be a bozo, he would act, he'd act like a bozo. I certainly had no inkling that he was going to go out and start killing people. Unlike many, he was somebody you could talk to. The two sides of David Carpenter. One side that people saw regularly was an insecure, innocuous man who was uh, to be disregarded. And the other David Carpenter was the 
the vengeful predator behind the gun or behind the knife and what is in control was it a mean, vicious, sexual, psychopathic killer. And it was this ability to compartmentalize his life that allowed Carpenter to pass under the radar for so long. The day Heather Skaggs was murdered, you know what he did that night? He went to the ballet. That's one of the characteristics that you see with that type of a personality. There is an ability to do it without any empathy whatsoever. And, and they can do this uh, like turning off, on and off a light switch. I mean, how do you murder execution style a woman or a man and six or seven hours later go to dinner, the ballet, cocktails, and socialize with your friends without thinking twice? But uh, David Carpenter was an evil, conniving, cunning individual. If uh, Carpenter can comport himself and say all the right things and, and be that kind of chameleonic, I'll say whatever I need to say to, to please you, then there's no reason to raise any red flags. So what then drove Carpenter to commit these twisted acts? Rape really is a crime about power and dominance. It really is, and, and that theme runs through every one of these things. And what we do know is there's 1960, long period in prison. He gets out in 1980, and what do we have? A 49-year-old guy who uh, commits all these murders. If you want to cut it down to its basic form, David Carpenter was a serial rapist. He had an insatiable sex drive that he could no longer control. The only way that he could continue to satisfy these urges was to eliminate all living witnesses. A common occurrence, if somebody molests or rapes somebody and they get caught and they go to jail, they're coming out saying, well, I'm not gonna stop. I'm just gonna kill them so there are no witnesses. And that's what it seems to be with, with Carpenter, is that he now has decided, I'm going to make sure I don't go back. Carpenter eventually received the death penalty for the brutal series of rapes and murders across central California. But were the motivations for these crimes forged in his childhood? Or was he a born killer? His mistreatment as a child must have had a severe impact on his psychological development as an adult and built up the kinds of things that created the kind of monstrous killer that Carpenter was. I don't think that Carpenter was a born killer. I think he just had so much going against him from his environment that there's nothing about him that indicates that he was born to kill, but, but from an early age, we we certainly see the danger of him becoming that type of killer. There are many, many people, thousands of people, that have had all of these serious problems in childhood and adolescence, and they don't go around killing all these women and winding up in prison and so on. So there is some, in every case, a significant neurobiological component. There really is. It just can't be explained totally by psychosocial uh, problems. Carpenter continues to protest his innocence from death row in San Quentin. However, his motivations may not rest solely in his past. He had a lousy childhood. OK, I'll accept that. If you took my childhood and laid it right next to David, we'd be real close. He's one of those folks that doesn't have that moral compass. And even though he's got to be, what, 80 years old now? I would say if you put him on the street today, within a week, there'd be a sexually assaulted dead woman out here. <laughs> 